Greetings, Time Lords and Ladies! Welcome to another OS Nerd creation. In this video, Next Step 0.8. This is a preview release that was shown on the launch of the next computer in October of 1988, and it also shipped with very early systems. And the system in question was the Next Computer which featured a Motorola 68030 CPU running at 25 MHz, a Motorola 68882 floating point unit running at 25 MHz, and a Motorola 56001 digital signal processor also running at 25 MHz. The system was originally shipped with 8 MB of RAM, and this could be expanded to 16 MB. Next Step itself shipped on a 256 megabyte magneto optical disc, and hard drives were optional, and either were 40 megabytes just for the swap file, or between 500 and 600 megabytes for storage. The display was a 17 inch megapixel monitor, which displayed 1120 by 832 grayscale. The machine, unfortunately, was somewhat expensive for its time, which could well have limited its impact. Now I am running this system using the previous emulator with 64 megabytes of RAM and a 2 gig SCSI disk. I will place the link for the emulator in the description below. Next Step itself is a Unix-like system that features a modified CMU Mach microkernel with the user land from 4.3 BSD. The windowing system uses Adobe's Display Postscript and the visual style is defined by Next's AppKit. Now the app kit itself was the basis for the UI side of the OpenStep specification, thus it is the great grandfather of modern day Mac OS. Alright, time for me to log in. Now I've created a brand new account for this demo, and I will be doing the same for all demos of the next step. This is so I can ensure that I get the system default template, and try and get as close to an out of the box experience as I can. Okay, so we see on the left-hand side in the top we have the menu, on the right-hand side we have the dock, and we also then have the default file browser window. Now the file browser window is controlled by the workspace manager. There must be at least one open at any one time, um, so if you have the last one open, don't be surprised if you can't close it. Uh, later on, they actually get rid of the close button on the title bar, to make this a bit more obvious. Okay, so I'm going to explain a bit about the menu before I do anything because um, although the menu is a menu, it is somewhat different um, in Next Step than it is uh, virtually everything else. And I, by different, I don't mean that, you know, it's not at the top of the display or it's not at the top of the window, instead it's vertical. Different in the way it works. Um, so for example, if I wanted to get at the properties of my home directory here, I could uh, uh, left click on the window, drag the mouse to more info, let go of the mouse button, and the more info dialog will pop up. Or I could click on window and go and do something else, maybe, maybe move the window up a bit, and then click on more info. You have to excuse the mouse, I haven't quite got the acceleration um, values perfect with uh, the previous emulator, so the mouse seems a bit weird. So yeah, so I can do that, but the menu persists. I can also drag the menu off and position that anywhere on the screen that I like, and I can do that for submenus. Now, uh, Motif did do something similar with some of its windows if they were enabled. I think TCLTK could do that as well. Um, but this one is quite nice because um, you can have the menus um, set up for your workflow. So if, if you use menus that don't have accelerator keys, um, you can just drag the menus out of the main menu, position where you want to suit your workflow, and that's good. Not only that, but this is the thing that makes it really unique amongst the windowing systems. Let's say you have an application that wants to use the full width of the display, and that menu gets in the way. Um, you can just drag the menu out of the way. And menu coordinates are saved on a per application basis. So the next application I load will have its menu in the top left. Um, and if I move that menu, then quit the application, when I go back into that application, the menu will be where it was, where I moved it to. 
And like I say, this, this can be useful if you have an application that uses a lot of screen real estate and the menu simply gets in the way. In later revisions of Next Step, um, they made it so that if you went into a, if, if I go into a, a subdirectory, the menu actually moves out of the way. In this particular version, it doesn't. The menu uh, goes off screen. Uh, which is a bit ugly, but there you are. Now this is a double-edged system because if, like me, um, you try and keep all the menus in the same place at all times, it is possible to accidentally move the menu and then you spend hours or minutes, um, depending on how good your mouse skills are, getting the thing back to, to um, the top left-hand corner. I think before I explain the dock, I'll, um, I'll explain how Windows work because one kind of leads into the other. Um, now, on the file manager here, uh, you have the, this black bar at the top, which is obviously a title bar, and then you have various buttons. And these buttons will look familiar to you if you've used Windows 9X or Windows ME or Windows 2000. Um, we can only speculate as to the reasoning Microsoft used to put these inside Windows 95. Um, I suppose imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, um, or something like that, maybe. Anyhow, um, on the far left, this, this weird kind of half square thing here, um, this actually is the resize button. Um, if you click that, it changes to four arrows to represent the fact that you, you're now in resizing mode. And the mouse pointer changes to an arrow depending on where you are in the window. And to resize, you simply just drag and, and move and let go of the mouse button and it resizes. In later editions of Next Step, uh, this was removed and replaced with actual window decoration that you could use to resize. But in this release, you, you get to use the button. And then the next button along is the Iconify button. Um, this is a little picture of a window. Um, if you click that, it minimizes it, um, Iconifies it, is the terminology that they use, to what's known as the mini window. Um, and this is a small tiled window thing that represents the window itself. Double clicking on it will will uh, will restore it. And then on the far right we have the close button. And as I was saying, you need at least one file browser open, so I can't actually close this. Um, now the file browser itself is a bit weird. There's no scroll bars with the column view. Um, with the Milter column. There is later on in uh, Next Step. I think it started with Next Step 2. If memory serves, Next Step 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1.0 had this weird kind of button thing that you used. Um, I must say that I do actually prefer the scroll bars. The scroll bars just generally seem neater. I mean, not that it matters because in, in the file manager you can change it. Um, fastest is the simplest drawing. Uh, this is um, this was meant, the reason why it's called fastest is this takes the least amount of processing power to draw. Um, so this was designed, you know, if you're putting extreme load on the machine or if you're doing a lot of development or a lot of compilation or what have you, you could drop the file manager into this so it wouldn't take, you know, wouldn't be slow doing updates or what have you. And then we have the icon view, which is your traditional icon based file management. And then finally back to browser view. Anyhow, so um, as I was saying, um, there is one final aspect of uh, the window decoration um, that needs to be explained. Each application has got four components. It has the menu, it has the application windows, it has the mini windows for the application windows, and it also has what's called an app icon. Now, uh, let's see, is there one here? Yes, there is. So if I go into the Applications uh, folder and I find Terminal, I double click on that. Let's minimize the, uh, the file manager, get that out of the way. Okay, so here's a perfect example. We have a menu, we have a window, if I iconize that, we have the mini window, and then we have this. And this is the application icon. It represents the application on a whole. Now what I mean by that is if I had, let's say I had lots of uh, uh, windows open and the terminal window was getting in the way, I could just hide that and it would hide all the application windows and the menu associated with the application, just leaving behind this one um, application icon. Uh, I can get on with doing what I wanted to do, and then double click on the application icon, and boom, it unhides everything. Now this has another use, 
So I'll leave this there for the time being, because now I'm going to explain the dock. So the dock is similar to the dock you have in Mac OS, except that there's no directory stacks or anything like that. It's purely applications. Um, with Next Step 0.8, there are three tiles in the dock that, um, well, two tiles that are, that, are, that are required, and one tile that is better off in the dock, but it is left up to the user. Um, the default configuration has the dock entirely full of stuff, so I guess I get to show you how to remove things from the dock first. So to remove things, you just simply drag them out of the dock until they disappear. If you don't drag them far enough, the system will think that you've misclicked, and it won't do anything. So you have to drag them until the thing actually disappears. So let's get rid of this one, let's get rid of this one. Again, I apologize for the mouse. It is, it's not as good as it could be because I haven't set up the acceleration properly, so it feels a bit stiff to use. Okay, so there we are. So the first one here is just an, uh, a completely useless tile. It just has the Next Step logo. The one underneath it with what's meant to be a hard disk platter. It's not a CD-ROM, it's a hard disk. That's for the workspace manager. And the one right at the bottom, this is actually the, the recycle bin. Um, you drag your files on here, and if you want them back, double click and drag them out. Um, in later releases, it doesn't quite have the same thing. Um, this doesn't actually belong to... This is, this is actually um, an application icon defined by workspace manager. Um, so sometimes you'll have it right in the bottom by here because it's not docked. When you double click on it, it opens the window and vanishes. In later releases, it doesn't do that. So there we are, let's put this back. So the app icon here, this is the one for terminal. Um, if you wanted to, say you had this running and you wanted it to be a most used application, you just drag it and place it on the dock where you want. Um, other applications, you'd get to the Applications folder in the File Manager, find the application that you want, let's go for Mail first, and then drag it out and put it on the dock. Um, let's have Edit Next, and let's have Write Now Next, um, then I'll put Library. Um, and then I will put Webster and Quotations. And I think finally we will have Interface Builder. So there, that's all the applications that I want in the dock. So the dock, you might notice, is not flush with the right-hand side of the display. Um, I think this particular thing was added purely um, because someone got frustrated or, or irritated with the system. Let's say that you move um, a window and you accidentally move it off the screen. Let's say you, you, you completely go crazy, go nuts with the mouse and accidentally do that. Now if, there's, if the next, uh, if the dock was, was flush with the right hand side, you'd probably never get this window back, you know, even if you restarted because some applications saved the position of windows, you'd need to go in and, and, and enter console mode and delete your entire preferences to get that window back. Uh, but with the little five pixel gap on the right hand side, you just move your mouse, find where, it's, where it goes black, and just drag. Another way is, and I think this one was probably added more to increase the amount of screen real estate, you could just drag the dock down. So applications wise, this is a fairly usable um, contemporary Unix workstation. Um, unfortunately, I'm not networking this particular emulation, so I can't really demonstrate mail to its fullest extent, or the networking stuff to its fullest extent, but I can show you at least how the applications look. So this particular mail application pretty much stayed the same all the way through to OpenStep 4.2 and um, it was, I believe, the basis for early um, Apple Mail on OS X. But obviously it had a few modifications and, and worked better throughout the years. But this is the, this is the initial version. It does actually work, although I can't actually receive my email. I, again, I don't know whether or not it's because networking isn't enabled or because it's trying to do something that, that, that my user account's not set up for. Um, but if I try and get mail, it just 
tells me it can't build a table of contents for the mailbox and then stops. So, <coughs> whatever. So to send an email, you just click on send. Uh, the, the send window comes up and you just type in who it's for, the subject, blah blah blah, uh, type in your message, and then you click on deliver. Now you do have this other option. Um, you have voice, and if you click on voice, it comes up with, with the lip service panel, and um, I can't do this because it's not set up for Windows. Um, it, it can't use the, uh, the direct input device, um, so I'm, uh, I'm not going to do anything. But if you click on record, um, you could then speak into the microphone on the sound box, um, and then you press stop. Um, you could then play it back to yourself or erase it and start again. But once you click the X, it was embedded into the email as an attachment. You'd press the deliver and they'd, they'd receive a, um, an email and have a pair of lips on the bottom. They'd double click the pair of lips and it'd come up and they could listen to it. Um, and that's it. To reply and forward, um, rather than having options, um, say you click on a message, I, there's, no, there's no reply um, button. The only thing you could do is double click on an email and it would come up with the with the message viewer like so and you click on reply or you click on forward and um, make the changes you want and then click on deliver. The new button basically lets you create an, um, a brand new email so I start typing and I decide hey you know look um, I don't want to make this email anymore um, I could just click on new and it would clear all the values. You could set attachments by dragging into this attachment panel and you have an address panel that will show you users set up in the mail aliases file. Um, later on when they have net info and the likes it can go off the net info user list um, from the domain parent or, or, or from the mail aliases file um, etc. I'll demo that with next step 0.9 I think. Actually no, I'll demo it, I'll demo it with next step 3 because 0.9 is not going to be networked either. So that's the email application. Let's quit this. Now unfortunately with this particular version of next step with 0.8 there's no visual feedback on the dock to tell you if an application is running. So I'm trying uh, for speed's sake to keep only one application open at the same time. Um, I know I've got Terminal open, but Terminal doesn't really use much in the way of resources. So the editor, this is your basic text editor. This is um, this survived all the way through to text edit in, in OS X um, with a few changes. This has been set up so it opens with a directory viewer and you can double click on files and it'll open in the editor. So this is a simple plain text editor, although it does have rich text features and has been configured as a programmer's file editor to the point where edit is the default file editor that will open when you double click on Objective-C files and headers in the file manager. And that's pretty much all I can say about edit. Later on it does become more feature rich, but that's mostly because of the next application I'm going to show you. And that next application is right now. Now this was shipped as a word processor of sorts with the system, um, but a lot of um, third party developers started complaining because having a word processor with the core system does kind of give Next an advantage. I mean, who would want to pay for a third party word processor if one was shipped with the system? You know, um, even the documentation, if I go into library and then documentation next and let's let's have a look at the programmer's guide and if I double click on this so yeah right now is used for all the system documentation um, and like I say just developers complained that it was giving next an unfair advantage so next um, sold this off to another developer and I believe next step 0.9, next step 1, and I think next step 2 provided right now as a demonstration. So that's right now. Terminal application, there are actually two. Um, if I go back to the next applications directory, uh, there is a shell and terminal. The difference between the two, do I have that? Did I actually close? No, I didn't close. The difference between the two is terminal emulation. So, for example, with shell, uh, sorry, with terminal, um, stupid me, I get a full blown uh, VT100 emulation. Well, it's more likely going to be partial VT100. Um, and with the shell,
it is, oops, sorry my typing's crap, um, it is not really VT100, let's see, I don't know if I can, uh, no, so the, t the shell, it, it's just your basic kind of minimal, okay, you can interface with, with CSH or whatever shell you have, it's not a complete terminal emulator. I'm not sure why it had both terminal and shell, probably because Sunview at the time had shell tool and command tool, and um, when the engineers at Next compared Next Step to um, your regular Sun Unix workstation, they probably thought, you know, well, Sun have got this command tool and this shell tool, one of which is a proper uh, VT100, the other isn't, let's do the same. I really do prefer using the terminal, I prefer having access to Vi. Okay, so the next one down is library. Um, later on, this was renamed to Digital Librarian. Um, next had a component called Indexing Kit, which offered full file, uh, full text file indexing. And basically, you could build an index, and then you could use this application to search all your indices. So, if you wanted to search the next manuals for, say, um, oh, let's have a look, NX Zone. Maybe. I guess there aren't any. Let's have a look for something else. Let's have a look. Um, whoops. Let's have a look for Malloc. You have to excuse me. I really do appear not to be able to type today. So there we are. This gives you um, all the results for the word Malloc in the documentation. So if you click on it once, it opens in this preview pane and jumps to the first instance. And if you double click on it, it will open in its relevant application. Um, unfortunately, this is a man page, so the formatting is a bit weird, but it does open and let you view it. So that's the library. Um, by side effect of the fact that indexing kit exists, it provides you with a basic framework that you can use for other things besides searching through the contents of files. And this is this is demonstrated um, perfectly via the Webster application, which is the entirety of, of Webster's dictionary. So um, if I type in the word luck, for example, it then goes and finds and returns a definition for the word luck. Um, as well as having a dictionary, it's got a full-blown thesaurus, um, so I can look for synonyms, etc. Now, as well as having a dictionary, as an example of what indexing kit can do, it also provides you with quotations. Um, quotations lasted right the way through to Next Step 3.3, and this was an application that basically just let you search through the Oxford list of quotations, and also the complete works of Shakespeare. So if I look for my, my favourite Shakespearean word, there we have two, clo uh, two quotes from uh, William uh, Congreve, uh, Gladstone, and uh, Shakespeare. And that's pretty much it. Um, so like I say, this, this is the amount of applications you get does make this machine competitive with contemporary Unix workstations such as the Sun. So there is one application left to look at, and that's Interface Builder. But I feel that Interface Builder is too complicated an application to cover in such a short amount of time, so I plan a video purely on Interface Builder at some point. There are a lot more features I could have shown in this video, but to be honest, I'd prefer these videos to remain somewhat short. As we look at more Next systems in future videos, these features should become more apparent as the system improved. I hope you've enjoyed watching, and as usual, if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.